Hey, this is Ryan at Perfect Circuit. I want to talk about the ASM Hydrosynth. Uh, the Hydrosynth and ASM kind of seemed to come out of nowhere a few weeks ago, uh, but I've been lucky to spend a lot of time with it and can attest that it is a super well built synth. It sounds great, and most importantly, it's super fun to use. I don't know of anything else out there that's quite like it. We published an interview with ASM's design director, Glenn Darcy, on our blog, Signal. So check that out if you want to know a little bit more about the background of the company and the design of the synth itself. Uh, Glenn provided a ton of insights as to like why all of the individual sections work the way they do and where they got some of the crazy ideas that make this thing really unique. There are a ton of overview videos out there about what this thing is that give you a kind of bird's eye view of the instrument itself. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, the Hydrosynth is an eight voice polyphonic digital synthesizer. It's got three oscillators per voice, these kind of gnarly wave shaping sort of things called mutators, which we'll get into later. A ring mod, noise generator, mixer, two filters per voice, five envelopes per voice, five LFOs per voice. The envelopes can loop and the LFOs can work in one shot mode. And yeah, you know, that's, that's already a ton. Uh, there's a lot more to it. But in short, it's safe to say that this synth can do a ton of stuff and gives you a ton of options for sound design. So in this video, we're not going to go into depth into every individual section. Instead, we're just going to focus on the oscillators and the mutators, which for me are some of the most exciting parts of the synth because you can do so much with them alone. And honestly, even if that's all there was to this synth, I'd probably still love it as much as I do now. So yeah, let's dig straight into the oscillators. So in the Hydra synth, there are three oscillators per voice. Uh, you get to the individual settings for each oscillator the same way you do with uh, any of the other modules, which is via this module select zone on the panel, which is a pretty cool representation of the overall signal flow of the synth. So if I want to get to the individual oscillator settings, I just click over on the oscillator 1 button, oscillator 2 button, oscillator 3 button, and we're good to go. We'll get into some more cool tricks you can do with these buttons in a little while. First, I'm going to make sure that we have an initialized patch so we can hear just kind of the raw sound of the synth. The easiest way to do that is to press this init button twice, and it initializes the whole patch. So should hear the nice classic initialized all saw sound. Seems like it worked just fine. So if we go to the settings for oscillator one, we can kind of dig into some of the, the actual features of the oscillators. So there's some pretty basic stuff, just like overall tuning, which has a coarse tuning control here. It goes from three octaves below the played pitch up to three octaves above the played pitch. You also have a fine tune control right here. One of the other really cool tuning controls though is this key track parameter, which makes it such that you can make the keyboard track outside a normal 12 tone scale. Uh, this is a kind of crude way to do microtonal stuff. So if I turn key tracking down, You can kind of make some funky scales, and what's really cool is that this parameter can be adjusted independently for each oscillator. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for exploring uh, tonal systems outside the, the confines of like normal 12-tone equal temperament, uh, but that's an entirely separate topic. Really, the stuff that's probably most immediately interesting about the oscillators are the sheer number of wave shapes. So first, it's important to point out that the oscillators have two potential modes. The first mode is called single mode. The second mode is called wave scan mode. Oscillator 3 is always in single mode, so you don't even get the option to change it. But oscillator 1 and 2 give you the option to switch back and forth between wave scan and single. <laughs> 
So first, let's look at single mode, given that it's you know, the most basic way of understanding what these oscillators do. Uh, basically, single mode gives you the ability to define a single wave shape for each oscillator. Uh, and that wave shape can come from a built-in selection of 219, I think, but regardless, a load of different waveforms. Um, naturally, these do include standard analog waveforms, which are all lumped together at the beginning of the list, and things get increasingly wilder and weirder as you go on. So a quick scan through the wave shapes gives us basic sign, triangle, Try saw, 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 square, all the normal stuff that you'd expect. And then it starts getting a little bit weirder. So yeah, there are tons of different wave shapes. Uh, and again, each oscillator can be tuned separately and set to a completely different wave shape from one another. So you can get some pretty gnarly combinations of sounds. Uh, in fact, you can even modulate the wave selection, which is pretty neat. So if I press first over in the module select section, the modulation source I want to use, hold that button, and then press the module I want to modulate, it'll automatically set up a path in the mod matrix. So let's say I want to use LFO1 to control oscillator 1's wave shape. All I have to do is press LFO1, hold it, press oscillator 1, and then we go straight to the modulation matrix page, and it shows you all the different stuff you can do. Conveniently, it even centers in on the destination parameter by default, so you can go in and choose which parameter you're trying to modulate for your destination module. So if I just go here and select wave, dial in some amount, then LFO1 is going to modulate my wave shape. I'm going to go back to oscillator 1, pick a wave up around in here, go to LFO1 so I can control the speed of modulation. I'm going to set that pretty slow, and then you can hear the results. Cool. So that's a kind of brute force way to get some really gnarly, glitchy wavetable kind of stuff. Um, but you don't really have any control over the order of the waves. Uh, so if you're modulating with like a normal wave shape, you're always going to go through the waves in the order that they occur. And there, aren't, there isn't really a great way in this mode for making those transitions very smooth. So the change from one shape to another is always super abrupt, which can be really cool in some situations, but in others just like isn't what you want. And honestly, when I think about the sound of wavetable synthesizers or like old classic uh, similar synths like uh, vector synthesizers, the sounds are like way more smooth than this. And honestly, a lot of the purpose of early wavetable synths was to come up with ways to make more smooth transitions possible. So if those are the types of sounds you're going for, you'll probably want to go to the other oscillator mode, which is called again wave scan. So I'm going to reinitialize my patch. I'm going to head over to oscillator one. I'm going to select a sine wave first. Cool. And we're back to kind of normal state. So I'm going to switch mode to wave scan now. And the available controls for us now on this screen change. We see this thing labeled wave scan, which can go from one to eight. And we see this other option called wave list edit. So if I click on wave list edit, it gives me the ability to define a list of up to eight waveforms to use as a pseudo wavetable sort of thing. So I can go into each position here and manually select all of the individual waves I want to use. 
If you have a pretty clear idea of what timbres you want to be part of your wave list, this is a perfectly fine way of doing things. But there's a way faster way of just getting something going, where if you hold shift and turn one of these encoders, it actually adjusts all of the all of the positions in the wave list after the encoder that you're turning. So I can go and quickly dial in a set of things that I know sounds pretty nice. So all these horizon waveforms, all eight of them, tend to work pretty well together. So I'm going to go back to the oscillator page, and let's listen to what wave scan sounds like. See here that the results of doing this are way, way smoother than just switching wave shapes using single mode. And the reason is that it gives us the ability to completely smoothly interpolate between adjacent uh, shapes in the wave list. This is a lot more similar to the types of sounds you'd get out of a Prophet VS or a vector synthesizer. And I think that ASM is pretty smart to not call this wavetable synthesis, because really, old school wavetable synthesizers were more about using these enormous banks of wave shapes. You start at the left with a destiny or with a source kind of basic cool shape. You end with another cool shape. And then everything in between are just these like things that are more or less similar to the shapes at either end of the spectrum. Here, though, you can completely arbitrarily define this, and with only using eight shapes or any number fewer than that, do much smoother types of transitions. And of course, wave scan is also a modulation destination. So we can do the same sort of thing we did before, just pressing LFO1 and oscillator1, select wave scan as the destination parameter and we can start to get some cool modulation effects. Of course, it's also interesting to use different sources. For instance, the obvious kind of thing is that the hydrosynth has polyphonic aftertouch. So if we go into the modulation matrix and select poly aftertouch, it's really this simple to get these kind of PPG-styled sounds, but the aftertouch is polyphonic, unlike on the PPG wave where you had kind of like mono aftertouch on this like whole mechanical keyboard thing. Um, and that sounds like this. And again, this can be modulated with anything. Right now we're using, we use smooth shapes like a sine LFO and this aftertouch thing. But if you want to get more jarring effects out of this, you could also modulate using noise. You could use a sample and hold, uh, any number of things, and you can get a huge range of different results. So that's all there is to the oscillators. And you might be wondering, so where are all the, the cool oscillator tricks that we can usually do in a synth, like, or with you know, analog modules? Like, where's the FM? Where's the pulse width modulation? Where's the oscillator sync? And the fact is that the hydrosynth can do that stuff, but it does it in a pretty unique way that at least isn't like anything else I know of. Uh, instead of baking those controls into the oscillator itself, which is the most common thing, they instead have these processors that are applied after the oscillators called mutators. 
And the mutators have a ton of different ways of controlling the sound, from linear FM to sync and beyond. But even those terms sometimes don't quite seem to fit. Uh, so let's walk through all of these mutator types one by one and kind of see what each one has to offer and where it diverges from the way that we normally think about these synthesis techniques. All those other cool standard oscillator tricks happen in the mutator, which is a completely separate little module from the oscillator itself, though they're pretty intrinsically linked to one another. And they kind of challenge the way that I personally think about some of these concepts, like sync or pulse width modulation. But let's kind of look through each mutator type one by one so that we can see what's up internally and why they're a little bit hard to define. So I'm going to do the same thing as earlier, just going to initialize the whole patch and go to oscillator one. And just to make things super simple, I'm gonna start out using a sine wave, though obviously you can set your wave shape to anything you want out of that huge list of waveforms. Anyway, I'm gonna go first to mutant one. Uh, it's labeled mutant on the panel, but in the manual and within the synth itself, they're called mutators. So I think mutator is kind of the, the term, but either one works for me. Anyway, so the first type is linear FM, and you can select the mode over here. Uh, just this one's called FM Lin. And you can choose any modulation source you want. And there's actually a pretty huge range of sources. Basically, this turns this oscillator mutant or mutator combination into a simple two operator uh, FM voice, essentially. Um, by combining oscillators, you can do bigger stacks, but uh, first let's just kind of look at what's going on within a single, uh, single mutator. So you can do the kind of normal stuff you'd expect, which is you can use oscillator two as an FM source, oscillator three, you can use the ring mod as an FM source, you can use noise. Uh, you can even use the outputs of the mutants themselves. Uh, you can use the modulation, like the CV inputs. Uh, and what's really cool is that you can actually use a signal that's generated within the mutator itself to do the FM. So the mutator can produce its own sine wave and its own triangle wave in order to use as the modulator in the two operator FM setup. So let's listen to what this sounds like, doing a fairly simple sound. Uh, and here we go. So that's a pretty normal linear FM sound. The, the pitch is very well preserved. What's really weird about this is that the mutator is treated almost like an effect more than it is an actual modification of the bass wave shape itself. In fact, every mutator type has this dry wet control so you can adjust continuously between the raw sound of the oscillator and the wet sound, the output of the mutator itself. Uh, so this kind of requires for me a little bit of reprogramming of the way I think about FM because this isn't actually affecting the oscillator parameters itself. It's just, again, almost like an effect that gets applied after the fact. So whenever you're using the built-in sine or triangle oscillator as your modulator, you have this ratio control, which does exactly what you'd think it would. And you have a feedback control, which is able to replicate some of those really gnarly feedback algorithms from like a DX series synth or a lot of older uh, FM-based synths. So let's hear that. 
So you can get to some pretty edgy metallic sounds using this. The feedback goes all the way up to 150%. So you can get some really intense FM feedback, uh, easily beyond the kind of stuff that you'd normally get in an FM synth. Um, that said, you can use the, all these other sources to, you can even use Oscillator 1 itself as the FM source, which can get a little bit gnarly. You can use even the mutators themselves as the FM source, which gives you a kind of like extra level of feedback in a way. Anyway, it's important to interject at this point that things can get super wild with the mutators. And ASM doesn't seem to have really made any distinctions about what leads to making good sounds and what leads to making ugly sounds, like a lot of other synth manufacturers would do. And honestly, with these mutators, you can get to a lot of sounds that are super intense, but kind of have their own internal beauty in a way. Uh, so some of these sounds are pretty grating, but sometimes that's exactly what you need, and they haven't made it impossible. In fact, they've gone ahead and given us 150% feedback on a lot of these things, seemingly with the intention of helping us get to these edgier boundaries of sound design. Anyway, that's more or less it for the FM linear mutator mode. Let's go on to the next one. So the next mode is called wave stack. Uh, wave stack can be thought of as like similar to a detuning effect. Uh, essentially, it allows us to make multiple copies of an individual oscillator and uh, slightly detune them, get them a little bit out of phase with one another so we get these really weird shimmering sounds without having to reduce the instrument's polyphony. You know, most synthesizers, to get to this kind of thing, if they're a polyphonic synth, you have to say, okay, all eight oscillators, all eight voices, gonna play the same pitch at the same time, and we can detune from there. But at that point, the synth is essentially monophonic. You don't have to worry about that here, which is pretty dang cool. So I'm gonna go back to our oscillator, because doing this with sine waves is pretty lame. Uh, I'm just gonna choose a nice sounding wavetable thing. Horizon 4 sounds pretty sick, so we'll go with that. I'm gonna go back to Mutant 1 or Mutator 1 and listen to what happens when we turn up all these wave stack parameters, which are just blend and depth. So you get these really nice kind of glistening chorusy sounds that are again just like a ton like a Prophet VS or something like that, but with a very different, um, very different character because you can really pull it off polyphonically, which is super cool. Anyway, moving on, after wave stack we have OSC sync, and this is where we get our sync-like effects, though this is a super weird mode, and you can get to all kinds of crazy junk that is nothing like any sync you've ever heard. So in normal oscillator sync, you choose a master oscillator and a slave oscillator. The master oscillator is used to determine when the phase of the slave oscillator is reset. So if you increase the pitch of the master oscillator beyond the pitch of the slave, you get this effect where you get this kind of like crude pitch tracking from one oscillator to the next, uh, but the timbre also changes at the same time. And this is like the classic cars lead kind of sound um, all over the place in the 80s. And a lot of like jazz fusion stuff earlier than that. Anyway, so the oscillator sync here works a little bit differently. You still have to choose a source. Uh, the only available sources for sync are oscillator one, two, and three directly, so you can't use the mutators as a source for this. 
you wind up with this option for ratio, depth, feedback, all these things you wouldn't normally think about with sync. Uh, there's a practical reason for that. So let's just hear this as it is. Super subtle right now. Basically, depth controls the intensity of the sync effect, so let's hear that. So that's a pretty normal sync sound, uh, nothing super crazy about it. Ratio is another weird parameter though. So what ratio does, and this is where things really get away from typical sync territory, is it determines kind of how many times sync is applied within a single waveform cycle, which is pretty weird. Um, what's cool is that this can prevent you if you're using um, another oscillator as your sync source. It can help prevent you from having to go to that oscillator's page and change its tuning. So all that's happening from within the mutator page itself, that works regardless what source I'm using. So that's pretty cool. Whenever you start to use higher depths though and get the ratio away from harmonic, uh, harmonic intervals, stuff gets really weird. That's already pretty unlike any sync I've ever heard, and stuff gets even weirder when you start introducing feedback into the sync. So you can get these really wonky, almost like pitch shifting, phase modulation feedback sort sounds. Uh, again, this is not sync. This is something weirder altogether and much more interesting. <laughs> So yeah, that's about how insane you can get with all the sync stuff. Again, we have access to all those traditional sounds, but we have access to way weirder stuff too. So after sync, we get into the pulse width modulation modes. There are three of them, and you might be wondering why would I need three different forms of pulse width modulation, and the answer is that really these are not pulse width modulation at all. Um, you can definitely achieve pulse width modulation with them, but there's a lot more to it than that. So let's take a quick look at each of the three different pulse width modulation modes and see how they differ from one another. Uh, just to kind of do it and show you that it's possible, I'm first going to choose a square wave as our source, like you'd normally do with PWM, right? And kind of show you how it works with PWORIG, which I take to mean original, which is kind of the most normal form of pulse width modulation in this thing. 
Uh, you'll see a couple other parameters on here. We'll get to those in a second, though. So I'm set to be 100% wet here, and let's just hear it. So that's more or less normal pulse width modulation. You see there's some other kind of funky artifacts in the wave shape and sound that are very much unlike PWM, but there's a reason for that. So basically, you can apply this mutator to any wave shape. It doesn't have to be a pulse wave. It could be a sine wave. So let's look at what that's like. You can see it kind of like slices our sine wave into multiple segments and like stretches them out proportionally relative to one another, uh, which is pretty weird. Uh, the other really cool thing is that there's a ratio control too here, just like on our sync mode. Uh, so basically this allows us to determine the number of times pulse width modulation occurs within a single cycle of a waveform. Uh, when you use one, you get these pretty normal effects, but you can get things pretty crazy by doing other harmonic ratios. which effectively divides the waveform into even more tiny segments that do the same kind of proportional shifting thing. If you use inharmonic ratios, it gets even weirder and kind of gets you to a point where you don't even need an LFO to do normal modulation effects. That's literally just an oscillator and a mutator, no other modulation. The other cool thing is, like in our sync mode and FM mode, all of the PWM modes give us the option for feedback. So you can take stuff into pretty insane territory. You know, what does PWM feedback even mean? But here it sounds great. So with just a little bit of feedback, a little bit of inharmonicity, you can take a simple trick like PWM and turn it into something really insane. So let's take a quick look at the other PWM modes and see what they're about. Uh, there are some subtle differences and some kind of extreme differences for each of those. So the next one is PW Squeeze, which does a kind of similar thing to the other one. Again, you can use any wave shape as a source but it kind of shifts the balance of the wave shapes fluctuations in a slightly different way. So let's just see what that looks like and hear it because it's a lot easier than explaining it. Or with a saw wave, it's more like this. And you can do the same kind of ratio tricks and feedback tricks as in the prior mode. 
filters, no extra modulation. That's just pulse width modulation. The last pulse width mode is called PWASM, which in the manual is also referred to as warp mode. The reason is that it gives us access to this custom edit page where we can define individual warp point values. Uh, how exactly this works isn't entirely clear to me yet, but it sounds great, so I'm just going with it. If we go back to the main mutator page, you can kind of see what this winds up doing. The effect is a little bit easier to see using a, a kind of pure waveform like a sine, so let's do that. So this is nothing like pulse width modulation. Frankly, I'm not really sure why they decided to call it that, but whatever, because it sounds great. Uh, honestly, the effect in the end is a lot more like a really intense linear FM or like wave folding almost, uh, but it's its own really cool thing. And like the other modes, has this ratio and feedback control that lets you take things into, into space. <laughs> Pretty crazy, doesn't sound like any pulse width modulation I've ever heard, but it sounds awesome. That takes us to the last mode, which is called harmonic. You can think of this kind of as a way of accentuating certain overtones in a sound and de-emphasizing other ones. Uh, if you've ever used like a verbose harmonic oscillator, it's kind of similar to like what the width and scan controls do on that. Um, the best way, again, to kind of hear what this is all about is to just listen to it. Thing to keep in mind is that it works best with harmonically rich waveforms, of course, because in, uh, in like a sine wave, there aren't any harmonics to emphasize, right? So let's just use a saw wave, uh, since that's our most harmonically rich waveform to go with right off the bat. In this case, the depth control is sort of like a width of the harmonics that are passing, and the ratio is like the center of those, more or less. So we'll kind of hear what those sound like. Kind of has the vibe of like a super resonant filter or something like that. It sounds pretty cool. This also has a feedback control, but the feedback in this mode isn't quite as intense and grindy as it is in the others. Um, largely because it introduces some destructive interference in the feedback loop. So it, it's a much gentler and much more subtle thing in most situations. You just kind of have to try it and feel it out, but it can be really useful. So that's all of the mutator types. It's important to remember that there are two mutators for oscillator one and oscillator two, uh, and they can be combined together in a lot of different ways. You could make one all the way wet and then adjust the balance on the other so you can kind of hear both coming through, or you could make it such that you hear the raw waveform as well. Uh, because these things really do act more like effects than they do modifications to like the oscillator wave shape itself, you can get to a lot of territory that is like nothing else I've ever heard. Uh, 
Um, you can even do things where you adjust from the straight oscillator waveform to this really intense grinding sound completely smoothly uh, and are always able to get back to the much calmer version of the thing. And given the fact that there are a lot of ways that these can layer with each other or relate to one another, even between different uh, oscillator sets, there's a ton of potential for sound design here. It often leads to creating really gnarly, intense sounds, but if you listen very carefully as you go, you'll find that there are a million sweet spots for basically each of these types, and you'll find some cool way of using them in your own sound design practices. So that's an idea of some of the stuff you can do with the mutators. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that oscillators one and two both have two mutators each, which cascade into one another. So you can use these effects in any combination to create an enormous range of sounds. And that brings me to like one of the most common complaints I've seen so far about the Hydra synth from people online, which is that technically it isn't multi-timbral. And while that may be true in that you can't uh, create multiple patches and then layer them the way you can with most multi-timbral synths, the fact that we have so many different sonic resources baked into each voice, that is these three oscillators and four mutators, means that you can do a lot to create individual layers within a, a sound. Um, the fact that you can use silence as one of the wave shapes for a wavetable, and the fact that you can route oscillators to different filters and then modulate those filters differently really gives you the raw ingredients you need to do something multi-timbral. You just kind of have to build it yourself from the ground up. The other really cool thing for me about the Hydra synth, which I've touched on a little bit before, is that ASM didn't, in making the mutators and the oscillators and the modulation matrix as a whole, prohibit the creation of modulation paths or signal flow paths that might inherently seem unmusical to some people. They really embrace feedback and embrace the possibility of creating these very knotted networks of sounds that can go into completely uncharted territory for sound design. Rather than deciding to keep us away from all the stuff that might make ugly sounds, they've instead given the torch to the user of the instrument and allow them to make aesthetic decisions, which for me is really cool. Honestly, I think any instrument that has this type of rich potential for sound design, both with familiar and completely new techniques, promotes a type of listening that means that the sounds created are both rewarding for the person creating them and for the people that hear them in a way that most synths out there aren't. So the hydrosynth really is its own thing. Uh, just digging into the oscillators and the mutators alone, it's capable of a lot that just nothing else can do. And I'm really excited to see what people wind up doing with it. <laughs>